All right, today I am going to be reviewing for the exam. So <clears throat> before I bring down the, the screen, I want to remind us of the basics of optics. Basically, the basics of our lenses and mirror optics, to be specific. So they're all based on what you see. Can you guys see this slide, or should I turn off the projector? Without standards, I'm going to turn it off. So we have light traveling as a ray. We started with the ray model. And then if we have light hit a mirror, we have our law of reflections that says the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Then we went to curved mirrors. So here is a concave mirror. When the parallel rays hit the concave mirror, they all meet at one location. That's one of the things for racing. Parallel incident rays meet at the primary focal point. <laughs> the only focal point if you have a mirror. And for this mirror, the focal length is equal to one half the radius of curvature. So since it comes to a focus here, then if you double that distance, this is the center of the circle that is marking out the curvature of that mirror. Now, if I go from a concave to a convex nature, how is it going to change? Okay, it's going to spread out. It diverges. And so now if we were to extrapolate back, we would find that these all meet somewhere like there. And so it still has a focal point, if you will, a place where parallel rays meet, but the rays themselves don't meet. It's the extrapolations of the rays. And so this here is a virtual focal point because they don't actually meet there. It's the projections that meet. And in the case of the virtual focal point, the focal length is less than zero. It's a negative focal length if it's a virtual focal point. So parallel rays meet at the focal point, whether it converged or diverged. But it was the extrapolations if it was diverging. It was the actual rays if it converged. Now if we go to lenses, a convex nature lens brings them together, converges. So once again, parallel rays meet at, what should we call this point? The focal point. Now this is the primary focal point, and because light works the same forward and backward, there is a secondary focal point that's back here. So we should label this F and this F prime. I made a mistake in one of my diagrams for the uh, doing the problems on the worksheets where I had F and F prime labeled wrong for this example. What's going to happen when I put the concave nature lens there? They're going to diverge. So what does that tell you about focal point? It's going to be on the same side as the lasers. It's going to be on the same side. They are going to, the extrapolations converge back here. So that's, again, a virtual focal point. It's a negative focal length. So this is the primary focal point. This is the secondary one here. The reason I'm going through these is when we do our ray tracing, we're using just the rules we saw there plus one more. One more, if I have a parallel piece of glass, that's not a piece of glass. Here's a piece of glass. Parallel piece of glass, the lines come out parallel to how they went in. They're diverted a little bit down here, but in the thin lens approximation, the thickness is zero, so there won't be any diversion. They just go straight through. So those are the basics for how we draw our ray construction. Remember, the test is going to have a ray construction problem where you are going to be graded on the accuracy of your ray construction. Not the accuracy of your answer, but of the ray construction. So it's important to know how to do that right. It, um, I will supply. So, whoops, put it in this one so I can do my ray constructions better. So now looking at things to know from chapter 25. Know why light can be treated as rays. 
because it travels in straight paths. Be able to apply Huygens' principle or Huygens' principle. Huygen, Christian Huygen was his name. Huygens' principle, the one that says any point on a wavefront, so you should know what a wavefront is, can be treated as a point source of light. The laws of reflection and refraction. Well, what's the law of reflection? Anyone? Go ahead. Yes. Angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. How do you determine the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection? It'll be um, relative to the line of the surface. Okay. It's relative to the surface normal. So here I put in red the surface normal. So if I have an incident ray, and I'm just going to draw it freehand, an incident ray that comes in like this, that's the angle of incidence. Exit ray like this, that's the angle of reflection. And you have to put all the way out to L if you want to distinguish it from refraction. Then the law of reflection is theta incident equals theta reflected. And you have to know it's from the surface normal. Now, if you were doing your reflections and you measured from the surface itself, you would get the right answer. But when you get to refraction, you wouldn't. So for refraction, so refraction, here's my surface. Wow, I got it quickly there. Here's my surface normal. Actually, I'm going to chase, choose the same colors. I'm going to have this, the surface be the black line, the surface normal be the red line. And so I'm going to have light come in like this. It's refracted, so it's going to go through. It goes like that. Where is the angle of incidence measured between? So this is... Okay, so there's the theta incident. And where's the angle refraction? Yeah. And then we have N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2, Snell's law. So you need to be able to use Snell's law and apply it accurately. So those are the laws of reflection and refraction. Total internal reflection. We talked about it kind of briefly, actually. Total internal reflection is a result of N2 is less than N1. It can only occur if N2 is less than N1. If N2 is greater than N1, it cannot occur. It can produce sine theta twos that are bigger than one if you use Snell's law. But sine cannot go bigger than one. Sine theta is always between minus one and plus one. And so when that equation predicts that sine theta two is bigger than one, Snell's law breaks. And you no longer have refraction, you have total internal reflection. And so we define theta critical such that sine theta critical is equal to one equals n1 over n2 sine theta critical the critical angle is the maximum incident angle that will allow you to have light refracted at 90 degrees if the angle is bigger than theta critical it'll be totally internal reflected yeah that's a one in the middle um yes that's a one in the middle Yes, I started to write, I think, an S. There, I tried to write a 1 and didn't do a good job. There. 
Geometry of a rainbow. Remember your basics, first order rainbow, light comes in, refracts, reflects once off the bat, comes out, refracts out again. Second order rainbow, light comes in, this time at the bottom of the rainbow, of the droplet, refracts in, reflects twice, then refracts out. So second order rainbow, two reflections. First order rainbow, one reflection. Because the speed of light is different for different colors, the amount of refraction for different colors is different, and that's why we have now the light spread out. So we look at this angle, we see one color. This angle, we see another color. Because of the different speeds of light for the different colors. And then be able to find image positions and heights produced by a lens or a mirror, both graphically and by calculation. And you're going to have a graphical problem. You know that. You can take it to the bank. There were six options on that worksheet. One of those six options is going to be what you have. Either you're going to have a converging lens or converging mirror with an object closer than the focal length or farther than the focal length, or a diverging lens or mirror. Those are the six options. And so I don't know if y'all looked at the solutions that I did last night, but I have here you know, the diagrams for each one of those, and I'm going to do another one right now, but you can look and just make sure, you know, if you listen to it on YouTube, you can hear me go through in the order for how to do each of those drawings because you know you're going to have one. So let's just do a single example here today. And I have first, oh, come on. First, just the order of what to do. So first, draw your principal axis. The principal axis is the horizontal line that goes through the bottom of your object and through the center of your lens. Then draw your lens or mirror and identify the primary and secondary focal points using an accurate scale. Let's do those two things. So there's my principal axis. Go ahead. So, Pastor, are we going to be able to have rulers? Yes, indeed. Okay. You, you need it. Otherwise, you won't have an accurate drawing. Yeah, if you don't use a ruler, you're not going to have a good result on your grade. Um, yes, I will. I will have all of the rulers that I can get my hands on. And then we have lots of protractors, which are shorter versions of rulers. Okay, after I've drawn my principal axis, what do I need to do then? Okay, draw the lens or mirror. So what should I do here just for practicing class, a lens or a mirror? Okay, I got a mirror. Mirror it is. I draw my mirror or lens by drawing a straight vertical line. Is this going to be a converging or diverging lens or mirror? Excuse me. You choose. Okay, so we have diverging. To indicate that it's diverging, I just put that to say, okay, a convex nature is diverging, so there it's diverging. The reason I have the straight vertical line is because I want my rays to all change direction on that line. This is part of the paraxial approximation. Praxial approximation is saying that all of our angles are very close to parallel to the principal axis, which means that we don't have much curvature to worry about. It's all just hitting close to the vertex. It's not true, but it's an approximation to allow us to get reasonable results. Now I need to determine what the focal length is. So just choose, well, I'm going to choose a focal length of 15. If it's a mirror, I only need to draw one focal point. You don't need the second focal point. You just need the primary one if it's a mirror. If it's a lens, you need both the primary and secondary focal points. So the fact that you chose a mirror means I'm only showing the primary. Yes. How did you know the primary was going to be on the right side in this? How did I know it was going to be on the right side? Because he chose a diverging mirror. So 
still has to be on the side. A diverging mirror means that the focal point is on the opposite side from your object. Or if you have a mirror, the focal point is always on the side that the mirror is going around. Right? So here the mirror is going in a, in a circle like this. And so the focal point's got to be on this side at one half the radius. Okay. Now I just need to place an object and I'm good to go. Where is the object going to be located? Frankly, for this problem, I don't care. It's going to make a difference for your answer, but it's all going to be the same ray tracing method. So I'm just going to randomly put the object here. Actually, I don't like that position. I don't like that position because it's the same distance as I use for my focal length, but on the other side. Go ahead. What were you saying? Um, so in the problem, it would tell us how far it's going to be from you? Yes. Okay. So here's my object, and here's my focal length. Final thing before I draw is I need to draw my object, give it a scaled height. The vertical scale does not need to be the same as the horizontal scale. And so my scaled height, I'm just going to use a height of yeah, 20 of these markings. I made it really tall. So there's my object. Now, probably Andrew chose this because this is one of the more complicated in terms of remembering to get your rays right problems. So we had those ray descriptions. First, we have the parallel ray. Oh, yeah, I was, I was going through these steps. So we drew the principal axis. We drew the lens or mirror and identified the primary and secondary focal points. We only did primary because it was a mirror. If it had been a lens, we would have done primary and secondary. We drew the object, same scale for position. So here I have distance object is equal to 10 centimeters, focal length equals minus 15 centimeters. That comes from, remember, I counted out when I made my marks on the ruler. Draw three rays described on the next slide. Parallel ray. If you remember, or if you watch my, how many people actually watched my video last night? And I didn't finish it until like 7.30. So there's a few, good. I think I did a great job because, you know, <laughs> hopefully you think it's helpful. So first thing I'm going to do is draw my parallel ray. And it actually should be easier with this because I can make sure it's perfectly parallel. The problem is all the other ones I can't get perfect. So my parallel ray I'm going to do in red. Parallel ray goes to the mirror. And then how does it reflect? Through the, focal point. Through the focal point. Well, in this case, the focal point's on the wrong side. So it's going to be going. This is a projection, the direction it would go if it could go through, but it doesn't. It reflects. And so keeping that there. Oh, goodness. Didn't even know I could mess that up. So there's my parallel ray. Next ray, the focal ray. I use RGB red, green, blue. For the first time ever in my teaching career, I did not describe why red, green, and blue are the primary colors of light. Short answer, because we have three types of cones in our eyes. One's most sensitive to, well, one that is most sensitive to red and one's most sensitive to green is what we say. It's not exactly right. And one's most sensitive to blue. That's why we have RGB as three primary colors. So here I'm going to have a ray that goes toward the focal point. It doesn't go through. And this is not a projection of the reflected ray. So I'm just going to use dots to indicate what I was aiming at. And I'm going to stop there because you see it highlights something instead of drawing. I had that same problem last night. How does the focal ray work? If light goes to the focal point, 
then it comes out parallel. And the same is true here, so it's going to come out parallel. Get this back to zero degrees. Get it on the right height. And there I have my focal ray. At this point, you can see where the image is, but you're always required to do three as a consistency check. So the third one, and I'm going to start by measuring. The third one is the vertex ray. If it's a lens, the vertex ray is super easy. It just goes straight through. But if it's a mirror, it's reflecting back symmetrical about that principal axis. So I am just going to measure. I've got the height of my object was 20. And so I'm going to mark down 20. And so my reflected, um, and I should change color, red, green, blue. This is not a very good blue. Change the color. There's a darker blue at least. So my vertex ray should come out and hit that point I just drew. So it's going to go. This one here is actually not super important to be exact because we know exactly where it's got to hit. And that's where we're going to use the starting point for the next one. So it goes to the vertex and then it comes out. Now, if I was smart, I would have noted what angle I had this at and used that angle again. So there's my vertex ray and then the projection of the vertex ray. So there I have the three rays constructed. Simple, simple question to the point of almost being rhetorical. Do those three rays meet? Do the solid lines meet? Not in reality. The solid lines don't. Right, the solid lines are diverging. Does that mean no image? No, I'm not even gonna let you answer that rhetorical question. No, there's an image, it's just not a real image. It's a virtual image. That's where the three meet. And so I take my, I'm going to recolor this in black maybe. and go over here to where the three meet and measure the height of this. The height object was 20 and the height image is, goodness, I cannot, my fine motor skills. I know Lydia is already accepted into dental school. I could never do that. I just don't have the <laughs> coordination. So that's a height of 12. So height image equals 12, and I'm just going to put U for unit. My height of the object was 20 units. Oh, actually, I put centimeters. I put centimeters before, so. And then measuring my distance, my distance object was Actually, my distance object was 20, wasn't it? I put 10 here, but that's 20. My focal length then was 30, minus 30. And this is image distance of, come on, 5, 10, 11.2. Why did I put minus 11.2? Right, because it was on the other side of the mirror. It was a virtual image for a single optic. If it's a virtual image, it's always a negative image distance. So there's our ray construction. Go ahead. I don't know if like, this is considered not the right way to do it, but like 
I don't know, for me, like, I'm still kind of confused because, like, I guess when it's, like, real or virtual or, like, where the lines go, mm -hmm. could I do, like, the calculation first and then, like, say, like, okay, like, this is negative, so I know where it's going to be now and then draw it? You can do that. It will actually bias you toward the right answer. Right. Um, but I am only grading on having the right lines. Okay. And oftentimes when people do that, they will put incorrect lines to meet at the right place. And, well, they don't get good scores because they didn't draw the right lines. Okay. So if you have the right lines, that would be okay. okay. But I'm grading on the lines. Is it true that if the focal point is behind the object, then it's always going to be a virtual image? Um, is there any kind of like set rule that we can like kind of know like this if this if happens it'll be virtual and if this happens it's real? Sure. So here's some rules. If f is less than zero, distance image is less than zero. It's virtual upright. That's the first and easiest one. If it's negative focal length, you always have a virtual upright image. Then if f is greater than zero, and I need a second one, and distance object is greater than f, then distance image is greater than zero. It's a real inverted image. Otherwise, <laughs> upright. So there are the three fundamental outcomes you can have. If it's a a diverging lens or mirror that's a negative focal length, it's always going to be a virtual upright image. If it is converging, if the distance of the object is bigger than the focal length, it's going to be inverted and real. If the object distance is less than the focal length, it's going to be upright and virtual. And if it equals the focal length? If it equals the focal length, then it's at infinity. Could be, well, it, it's not a real image, really, because it never actually meets. It's the separator. Yeah. Okay, just so I have it clear, if it's virtual and it's on the other side of the... Now, this, this we have to separate between lenses and mirrors. If it's a mirror, a virtual image is on the other side from the object. Okay. Because that's the wrong place for the image to be. Right? The light never gets to the other side. Or, other side of the object, I said that wrong. Other side of the optic of the mirror. Because the light never goes to the other side of the mirror. So a mirror making a virtual image, it's always on the other side of the mirror. But a lens, it's reversed because the light's supposed to go through the mirror. Or, the light is supposed to go through the lens. And so if it's a positive image distance for a lens, then it's on the opposite side in a mirror. And if it's a virtual, then it's on the same side. So the lens reverses things because you have the place the image should be. For a lens, the image should be on the opposite side. For a mirror, it should be on the same side. So that's why it reverses. So negative is always virtual, positive is always real? Yes. Okay. Now, I say yes, and you can take that. It, for other people listening to this lecture online, that's if you have a single lens or mirror. If you have multiple lenses or mirrors, such as in a telescope or microscope, you can change it up. But for single lens, that's always taken to the Okay, you know this is going to be on the test. Right? Yeah. Okay, because I don't want anyone to be like, I just didn't say that. I was like, I didn't think that was going to come up. This one here will be hand graded for everybody. This will be one of the the last three and it'll be hand graded for everybody because I'm grading on your lines. You need to make sure you use an accurate scale. It doesn't have to be the same vertical and horizontal, but the horizontal scale needs to be accurate. You don't just throw your dots on there and say, this is approximately 10 centimeters and this is approximately 10 centimeters, 
right? You need to measure them so that you have an accurate drawing and use rulers for straight lines. That said, just like as you saw from my, well, as three of you saw from my solutions, the ray tracing drawings rarely come out exactly right. I'm not going to be like, oh boy, the answer was supposed to be 11 centimeters and he had, you know, 12.2. That's going to be okay if you did the rays right. Yes, Lydia. Do you want us to put like actual measurements like you did in the example? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Now, going with what Andrew said, what if I'm not feeling confident? I recommend that you do the calculation as well to check your answer. My, my recommendation is to do your ray tracing first and then check to make sure that your, your numbers are close to correct because that way you don't bias it. You can actually say, yeah, I must have done it right if it's the right place. So now if we do this same problem doing it relationally, we have distance object equal 20 centimeters. Focal length equals minus 30 centimeters. So 1 over F equals 1 over DO plus 1 over DI. Quickly yields 1 over DI equals 1 over F minus 1 over DO equals 1 over minus 30 centimeters minus 1 over 20 centimeters. These are convenient. Common denominator for this would be uh, 60. And so that's equal to minus 2 over 60 centimeters, minus 3 over 60 centimeters, equals minus 5 over 60 centimeters. So that means distance image is 60 centimeters, divided by 5 equals 12, and notice the minus sign that I forgot to bring over, minus 12 centimeters. So that would be the correct distance image. Pretty much matches what I said for I would give it to you. Right? It's not exactly right, but it's in the ballpark. And then for the height, we know that magnification is defined as height of the image over height of the object, but it's also equal to minus distance image over distance object. So height of image is height object minus height object, distance image over distance object equals 20 centimeters. Don't forget the minus sign times the distance image, which was minus 12 centimeters over the distance object of 20 centimeters. That turned out very convenient. And that is what I measured. So I, you can see it did not take very long to do the numerical calculation. So I recommend doing the numerical calculation as a check. I just recommend doing it afterward so it really is a check. And then if it didn't turn out right, then you know, well, let's figure out what I did wrong. Questions? You don't want us to do any calculation like on the ones on the test. Well, like, like I said, you can, right? I'm not going to mark you off for that. I mean, not, not for the ray tracing one. I might have another one that asks you to calculate. But for the ray tracing one, you don't have to. And you can, and my recommendation is after you draw it, do it just to make sure. So for this problem, we don't need to follow the same format we normally do for synthesis. We just have to do like what you just showed there. That's a really good question. You should identify what your three rays are. Say I'm going to draw the focal ray, which does this, the parallel ray, which does this, and the vertex ray, which does this, where they meet, I have my image. If it's virtual, explain why it's virtual. So you should have that much explanation. So it's not in the same vein, but you still have defined what those rays are. I'm really glad you asked that, Mira. Any other questions? Then let's move on because that's only the first chat. Now the first chapter is the biggest portion of the test. Chapter 20, was this, 25? Is the biggest portion of the test. Chapter 26, this was optical instruments and vision. So make sure you understand what myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia, 
and astigmatism are. So going real quick through those, myopia, also known as nearsighted. That means you can focus on near things just fine. Your near point's probably closer than the normal near point. But you can't focus on far things. And that's what most of us have if we don't have normal vision. So the correction for myopia is you need a lens that's going to take an object at the ideal or the normal far point of infinity and make an image at your actual far point. Which means then you can focus on things definitely far away through the glasses. For hyperopia, otherwise known as farsighted, you can see far just fine. In fact, people with hyperopia can technically focus on light that is diverging, light that's coming from farther than infinity away, which isn't possible, or light that's behind them, which, you know, it's weird. So they have a problem that they cannot see near things. So they need a lens that's going to take an object at the normal near point of 25 centimeters and make an image at their actual near point so they can focus on things up to 25 centimeters. So it's going to take a converging type lens to correct hyperopia, a diverging type lens to correct myopia. Then presbyopia, that's old people vision, which honestly I didn't realize that I was having old people vision until class when I measured my far point. Instead of being around 13 or 14 where it was last year, it was around 25 centimeters. 25 centimeters is normal, and most people would say, hey, no, I'm not a problem. Except for my far point is only about a meter. And so I have myopia, and now I'm adding to it presbyopia. And so presbyopia, the correction for presbyopia is exactly the same as the correction for hyperopia. But I can't have both lenses at the same time, so you use bifocal, so you have one you look at for near things and one you look to for far things. So the example, well, the worksheet problem with Pat, Pat has both myopia and presbyopia. So Pat needs bifocals to correct her vision. Finally, astigmatism. Astigmatism is you have asymmetric curvature of that cornea. And so it's corrected with a lens that's asymmetric. Or you can correct any of these four with laser eye surgery, where they reshape the cornea. Reshaping the cornea to correct myopia is not so hard because you just have to flatten the center part. Correcting for presbyopia, actually, I don't think you're gonna fix uh, presbyopia with uh, laser surgery because you can't do bifocals with laser surgery, right? I don't think so. Um, but um, for hyperopia, you actually have to make the cornea more curved, which is somewhat risky because that means you have to thin the edges of the cornea. Then you risk a corneal tear. So that's, that's a little riskier. Astigmatism, you can just resurface it to make it so it's symmetric. Laser ablation, vaporizing things. All right, so that's our vision. Then we had our optical instruments, telescope and microscope. You need to know, telescopes are optimized to focus on far things, tele. Microscopes are optimized to focus on tiny things that you can put wherever you want, micro. And so they're not opposites of each other. I, when I was a kid, I just thought they were opposites. I thought you'd take telescope, turn around to microscope. I never realized, you know, they're significantly different in shape and form. And so microscopes, you had a problem and it just gave you two lenses and says, which is this going to work for? One was a long focal length, one was a short focal length. Telescopes have a long focal length for the objective and a short one for the eyepiece. Microscopes have a short focal length for the eyepiece and a shorter focal length for the objective. So the fact that one was a long focal length meant that's not a good set for a microscope, good for a telescope. For telescope, the length is just the sum of the two focal lengths. Magnification is minus, minus because it's inverted, focal length of the objective or focal length of the eyepiece. Simple for the telescope. The first lens, the objective, is creating a real image that serves as the object for the eyepiece. And you get your magnification based on the 
Um, well, based on the angular magnification between what you would have seen if you looked at it with your naked eye versus what you see with the eyepiece. The microscope was a much more complex derivation for the magnification. And so I'll give you that equation. We're not going to go through the, the derivation of it. But you have the object close to the focal length of the objective, which makes the image a fair distance away from the objective. So even though it's a very short focal length, the distance might be seven centimeters away from it. And then you put the eyepiece to magnify that so you have a, an all, uh, not altered, a relaxed eyeball. Make sure you know the difference between accommodated and unaccommodated viewing. Unaccommodated, the eyeball is relaxed. Accommodated, the eyeball is straining. So it's focusing on something closer. The accommodation comes by squeezing that crystalline lens so you can focus on things that are closer. It shortens the focal length. And make sure you know transverse magnification. That's the one I've just finished using. Transverse magnification is defined as height of the image over height of the object. Whereas angular magnification is theta um, aided over theta unaided, it's the ratio of the angles that the image will make with the eye, or the, what you're looking at, makes the light makes with your eye. And so for the telescope and microscope, we were calculating the angular magnifications, a different thing than transverse magnification. Any questions about telescopes, microscopes, or for that matter, the human eye? All good? Is this mainly just like conceptual with like small calculations? Um, there, there will be the other, okay, so you're gonna have three synthesis questions. One will be the ray diagram. And then you'll have one from chapter 26 and one from chapter 25. And so you'll have a synthesis question from this. Yes. I know for microscopes and stuff, they talked about uh, the numerical aperture. Yes. And like some. I, I'm not going to ask you about numerical aperture. And F over like hashtag. F over hashtag? Yeah. You sure that wasn't F over sharp? Sir, sure, <laughs> F over sharp. Uh, are, we, are those going to be? Because our well, is doing a lot with those equations. The the, the f stop is, I think, what you're talking about. The f stop yeah. is focal length over the um, diameter of your lens. That's not. That, that's that's the f stop. No, I did not lecture on that. We're not going to have that. Okay, as one of the sure. So you just said that we'll have one synthesis over the blaze, one over chapter 26, and then one over chapter 25. Um, right, this is 26, 25 is the, the one that had the ray diagrams and stuff. So something that has to do with Snell's law or I reflections. Just wanted, I just want to make sure you didn't say chapter 27. No, I did not. I, 27 we only really covered in black, yeah. so that's why I didn't have a synthesis problem. It's just you said 26 and then 25, so. Yeah. Okay, so chapter 27, wave optics. We studied two pieces of wave optics, diffraction gratings and polarization. I have reflection grating here. The difference in diffraction grating and reflection grating, diffraction grating has slits and light passes between them. A reflection, reflection grating has mirrors that are set like this. And so the reflection grating is actually, it, it's more efficient. They're, they're blazed for a specific angle and you have very high efficiency in a certain range of wavelengths. Um, you don't need to know the difference in the reflection and the diffraction. So just, they're both using diffraction. They're both using the same rule. So the rule you need to know for this, obviously it's given to you, is D sine theta sub M is equal to M lambda for constructive interference, where D was the spacing between slits. And then for the polarization, you need to know the law of malice, theta that is transmitted is equal to the incident 
intent uh, instead of data intensity this transmit is equal to the instant intensity times cosine squared of the angle between the instant polarization and the second polarizer so something to make sure we understand and once again if you go through the worksheet i covered this if i have unpolarized light and then it goes through a polarizer I'll put it at zero degrees. The angle does not matter for this at all. What's the intensity of the light that comes through? You had light that was polarized in all angles. How much of it do you think is going to be parallel to my polarizer if it's equally distributed in all angles? When you go through, and I started doing this incorrectly, I think, in my review yesterday, you have an electric field like this. So you break it in, into components. And so, actually, I should have made it match my picture. Electric field like this, and you break it into components. And so here is my E parallel, and here's my E perpendicular. The E parallel is what gets through. And so the electric field that gets through is equal to the integral from zero to, oh, let's go zero to two pi today, of E parallel d theta. Of, and if you go from zero to two pi, you know, you get, you get zero. But if you go from zero, if you go from zero to pi, that's half of the way. Um, you you get your answer, which should give you one half. Um, yeah, it, it does give you one half. And so that's that's the way the cookie crumbles here. You're going to have one half. Once again, I didn't think it through. Hopefully, that's correct. One half the instant intensity gets through the polarizer if you have unpolarized light going through a polarizer. Then if I put a second polarizer, let's say theta equals 30 degrees, what direction will the light be polarized when it comes out? 30 degrees. And what will its intensity be? All that matters is the angle between this and this. So it's going to be I1 cosine squared of theta 2 minus theta 1. So if I have another polarizer, I would have cosine squared of theta 3 minus theta 2. I don't go back to theta 1. It's just from the last one to this one because I'm comparing the polarization direction coming in, the polarization coming out, and this is the polarizer. So the problem that I did went on one further, had a polarizer like this. If you took out the middle one, you would have had zero. But with the middle one in there, the intensity you got through was about 5% of my example of the worksheet. Okay, that's the stuff that you need to know for the exam tomorrow. You can do it.